In this week's episode of Bleach the Thousand Year Blood War, Head Captain Yamamoto takes on who he believes to be the Quincy King himself, Yuha Bark, in a fierce and fiery showdown. He activates his amazing, all-encompassing visual spectacle of a Bankai Zanka no Tachi, and yet, in the end, seemingly has his hard-fought victory and maybe even his life snatched away from him. Yes, this is it. The big one. The episode we've all been waiting for with bated breath ever since the first invasion began. This is the episode that all previous episodes of the Thousand Year Blood War have been building towards. Episode 6, The Fire, depicts the titanic duel between the head captain and Sternritter Y. Roid Lloyd, who is posing as his god king, Yuhabak. As I said in my live reaction, I think this will be the defining moment, the pinnacle in many ways of this first season of the new anime. That's not to say there aren't still great moments ahead. I mean, you only have to look forward a few chapters to see that there are still fantastic fights, exciting plots, and intriguing new characters to be seen. But I think this episode and this fight will go down as the turning point. The battle that ultimately seals Soul Society's fate and changes the Bleach universe forever. There's a lot they needed to get right here, and to say the pressure is on would be an understatement. And so, in our in-depth spoiler review and discussion, we'll be looking to see if this episode managed to deliver on all fronts. As we always do, we'll be looking at the episode through the lens of someone who has read the entire series, so there will be full spoilers for the whole of the Thousand Year Blood War arc to come, as we take a look at what the episode added, changed, and even took away from the source material. But before we get started on the video, guys, if you haven't hit subscribe yet, make sure to do that now for more Bleach content like this every single week. And if you enjoyed the video, make sure to give it a thumbs up as well to help support me and the channel. And if you want to take that support for me another step further, I do also have a Patreon as well. And as always, I want to give a massive shout out and a huge additional thank you to everyone who is supporting me over there on Patreon. I really do appreciate each and every one of you. And so, as always, before we dive headfirst into our in depth spoiler analysis, we need to take a look at what the episode actually covered. And would you believe it, I was actually right with my predictions from last week as to where this episode would end, and mostly with where it would begin, although not quite. But yeah, I think they chose the perfect number of chapters to cover here, and I think the cliffhanger they chose for this episode was absolutely the right decision for them to make. So, what chapters did they actually cover then? Well, the episode starts by covering chapter 506, The Fire 2, 507, The Fire 3, 508, Like a Raging Inferno, 509, Tenchi Kaijin, and 510, The Extinction. And like I said, 510, absolutely the right place to end this episode. That is the perfect way to leave audiences hanging, while also hopefully giving them enough time to do the following chapters justice in episode 7. But really, all those chapters that I just listed cover the entirety of the battle between Yamamoto and Royd. It really is the first proper fight we get in the Thousand Year Blood War. And as I mentioned last week, I am hesitant to call it that because it is doing a disservice to battles like Ichigo versus Kirge and Byakia versus Az, but there's no getting around the fact that this is our first fight in the Thousand Year Blood War that is a consecutive, multi-chapter spanning fight. But despite all of that, the episode begins with a completely new scene. Suffice it to say, I didn't see that coming. And we're back once again with Uryu Ishida, which I think people are going to be ecstatic about, getting more of Uryu and his perspective on the events that are unfolding as they are unfolding is really, really cool and gives us a new insight into one of the main characters of the series who should have been playing a major role in an arc about the Quincy's. And actually, what I think they're doing with this scene is really cool. We'll get into it a little bit later, but what I think they're trying to do with this scene is to build up this idea that Uryu is feeling increasingly isolated from his friends as the war against the Quincy's, his own race, escalates. And I think 
they are trying to do something in particular with this scene that we'll talk about a little bit later. But anyway, Uryu is sitting alone underneath a bridge on the riverbank, continuing to read deeper into Soken Ishida's tome on Quincy history that of course involves texts on the Vandenreich. There's a small image of the Palace of Silburn there, which is very interesting because this must imply that Soken has at one point been to Silburn, presumably. Soken was a part of the Quincy who were hiding in the shadows a thousand years ago, and maybe decided afterwards that he didn't want to be with these extremists. He wanted to try and forge a path of peace between the Quincy and the Shinigami, and so abandoned the Vandenreich, abandoned the kind of shadow world that they live in, and decided to make a life for himself in the human world instead. I'm hoping we get concrete answers to these new questions that are being raised, but regardless, Uryu is reading deeper into their lore and into their history. And as he does so, he discovers a secret truth. Uryu learns that there was a Quincy extermination not just 200 years ago, the well-publicised one that everyone knows about, but actually a thousand years ago as well. We get this sketch drawing of a younger Yamamoto incinerating Quincy's, which genuinely looks a bit haunting. Obviously, this has been drawn by a Quincy, by a survivor, and so it makes a lot of sense that they would depict Yamamoto in such a demonic way. But the Quincy victims who are being torched by Ryujin Jaka looked like, genuinely look like they are suffering. It's a pretty creepy and eerie image. After this, we get our title drop of the episode, The Fire, and like I mentioned last week, the chapter The Fire, 505, was actually adapted for last week's episode, so they didn't really have a title card to try and adapt this time, although what's cool about this episode's title is that the final chapter that this episode adapts, 510, is actually the first chapter featured in volume 58 called, you guessed it, the fire. We then return to the Soul Society where we see Yamamoto emerging from this huge wall of flame, embers and flames licking and clinging to his feet, which I think is a really awesome detail. There's then a brand new scene here of Yamamoto rescuing Zaraki from Royd, which I think is really awesome. It's a great moment. He zips past Royd so quickly that the Sturmritter has no idea really what's going on. And it's just really nice seeing Yamamoto with Zaraki of all characters in his arms, laying him on the ground gently. These, like, tracks of fire behind Yamamoto where he has moved with such speed where his Ryatsu is flowing off of him so as to look like fire. Really awesome little details. But in general, I think this scene, surprisingly for how short it is and how inconsequential you might think it is, actually adds quite a lot. Previously, I mean, I just kind of imagined Roy dumped Zaraki on the ground as this new fight emerged in front of him. But here... It feels like we are treated to the last lingering embers of Yamamoto's compassion before he is once again embroiled in an intense rage that just consumes him until the end of this fight. So that's two brand new scenes in a row, but we then transition into the real start of chapter 506, where Kyoraku succeeds in slashing Robert. Again, of course, this is the direct follow-up to the initial cliffhanger of the last episode. Kyoraku slices Robert Akutron across the chest. Blood spurts out everywhere as Robert skids backwards, creating a bit of distance between the two characters. I have always loved this moment, and I think it's really great here as well, but I love the fact that Robert starts speaking the first time we've heard him talk, and he says to Kyoraku, you know, it's great that you've managed to get your morale back, but you're all misjudging one small thing. Your boss will lose to our boss as Yamamoto advances ominously on Yuha Bark, the camera spinning around them both as though they are kind of encircling one another. And Robert says, I know that to be true because you guys aren't the only ones who get fired up when your boss gets into a fight. And as soon as he says this, three Sternritter jump Yamamoto out of nowhere as not Basby and Nanana Najikoop. So far, pretty much exactly like it is in the original chapter. However, here we do get really my one and only complaint of this episode out the way. And that's that I think this moment goes by so quickly that you can barely even tell who is attacking Yamamoto. If you hadn't read 
the original chapter, I honestly think you might not have any idea. In the source material, each of these three Sturmritter is given their own close-up and their own line that they all say to Yamamoto before they end up landing nearby. Here in the anime, the only one to say their line is Basby, but again, with no close-ups, with them only appearing on the screen for a few seconds max, maybe not even as much as that, you honestly wouldn't even really know. In the original chapter, these three Sturmritter all successfully land on the ground before Yamamoto does anything. We can tell this because there's a plume of dust that bursts out from behind the buildings where they land. At this point, Kyoraku says, oh yeah, you're right, I did misjudge something, and suddenly a glow flashes on Robert's glasses and he looks in horror as that plume of dust is suddenly replaced by a volcanic eruption, essentially, from Yamamoto's Ryujin Jacker. In the anime, this moment is cut down a fair bit, presumably because they wanted to get straight into the fight and have the fight take up the majority of the episode. But basically, as soon as the Quincy almost land on top of Yamamoto, they are engulfed by this inferno, by this explosion. But then after that, most of it is exactly the same. Robert still looks on in horror at this massive blast. Kyoraku, with a really sinister look on his face, says that, yeah, you're right, somebody did misjudge something. What you guys don't realise is that your conventions, they mean nothing in the face of old man Yama. And that is just such an awesome moment, to be fair, encapsulated really well. As Yamamoto's attack goes off, we're treated to some brand new shots of Hitsugaya, Soifon and Komamura from all around the Seireite. I particularly like the one of Komamura where Yamamoto's attack is kind of going off behind the centre of the city right behind him. That looks really, really awesome. And it's just really cool to get those flashes of the captain still having their morale boosted by sensing and knowing that Yamamoto has joined the fight and is already having such a massive effect. The close-up of As Not being completely engulfed in flame is cut here and instead we get a clearer shot of all three Sturmitter kind of collapsing to the ground behind this massive veil of fire, which we do kind of get in the original chapter but it is a lot clearer here. The next sequence is mostly the same as it appears in the manga itself, with Royd Lloyd basically saying, you know, are oh, you were fools for jumping in and interfering in my battle, Yamamoto cricking his neck, and that's so cool as well, Yamamoto coming across as really threatening before lunging for Royd with this blade of fire and striking his arm. There's a nice little detail here that wasn't in the original chapter where when Royd's blood splashes on the floor, it begins to boil, it begins to steam. That is a really cool little detail. And of course, Yamamoto chastises Royd for having that same attitude to those who would give their life for Yuha Bark's cause that he had a thousand years ago. In fact, there's a brief brand new shot of Yuha Bark standing atop a mountain of his own dead men. Very nice, very symbolic, as Yamamoto calls him out for that, for, you know, effectively using these people in his conquest. And these brief snippets, these brief flashes we get going back to the past a thousand years ago are really fantastic. They're not quite a full flashback, a full retelling, a historical context of the battle that this arc gets its title from, but it's better than nothing. It's really cool to see, and it adds a lot of emotional weight to this fight. We also get this cool shot of a younger Yamamoto, much the same as he appears in the original chapter, except there he's actually depicted wearing his captain's Hayori. We then get this fantastic extended sequence where Yamamoto just rushes Royd, again, leaving those scorching hot trails behind him. They begin to clash. Royd successfully manages to almost flip over and kick Yamamoto, sending him flying onto a rooftop, Royd gives chase, Yamamoto dodges, Royd smashes into the tiles, picks them up, flings them at Yamamoto, who basically turns them to flaming tiles, repels them with a yell of his own voice, sending his Ryatsu into these tiles and flying back at Royd. This is all absolute craziness. This is insanity, and it all looks absolutely amazing. This is then followed up by Yamamoto lunging after Royd, flipping through the air, bringing his blade down, cutting a building in half. Royd skidding backwards to get out of the way, but Yamamoto is on him again immediately. He appears behind him. There's this really awesome dynamic slow turn where Royd glances over his shoulder. Yamamoto looks up at him, brings his blade up towards who he thinks is the Quincy King, flames following it, but just in time, Royd manages to get his Quincy cross, activate it, summon his sword, and cut the Wall of Flames in half. Of that extended sequence, 
literally only the last moment is in the original chapter, and it's definitely not as dynamic as it appears here. In the original chapter, after Royd kind of mocks Yamamoto, saying, you know, seeing you give yourself into anger like that really reminds me of your younger self, and Yamamoto tells him to shut up. In the original chapter, he basically just swings his blade at him once, creates this big barrage of fire, and Royd summons his spirit weapon and cuts the wall in half, which is exactly the same as what happens at the end of this sequence, but with all that extra goodness beforehand. But we're then treated to another beautiful sequence, and this whole episode is just stunning to behold. From the lighting, from the movement, everything looks so fantastic. And I think it's actually really well encompassed in this next sequence where Yamamoto says, you know, why was I waiting for you to draw your sword, do you think? It's because I want to crush everything that you are into nothingness. And as he says that, his blade kind of erupts and then shrinks into itself and all of the fire from across the Seireite vanishes. And in that instant, the lighting goes back to normal. I think that's really, really clever. It just goes to show what a powerful effect Yamamoto was having on the battlefield at the time for it to instantly return to how it was before the clouds even became overcast. But I mean, what an amazing way to signal the arrival of Yamamoto's Bankai than to just strip the battlefield of everything that it had. There's a really cool kind of overhead shot of the Seireite and you see that the, whatever flames there were, whether it be Quincy flames, whether it be the blue flames or Yamamoto's own fire, it has all vanished. It's all gone, leaving nothing but a somber kind of drifting of smoke in its wake. Both Royd and Hashwolf are both like, what on earth is going on? Now here, they play with the structure a little bit. This is actually the cliffhanger moment of chapter 506, which of course ends with that legendary panel of Yamamoto saying, Bankai Zanka no Tachi. But instead, that's not quite how they do things here in the episode. Here, we actually move a few pages into chapter 507 to get the immediate reactions of everyone around the Seireite as Zanka no Tachi begins to take hold. You get Ukitake struggling to breathe in this immense heat, Kyuraku's lip cracking, the water in the vase in the fourth division beginning to disappear, Isane's skin feeling really dry. All of this is from a little way into chapter 507, but I think it works really well here. Obviously, with the source material, Kubo needed a cliffhanger for 506, which is why it makes sense to show Yamamoto saying and activating Bankai right there and then. But here, where you don't need that cliffhanger, you may as well build the tension, build the suspense, show us the atmospheric area of effectability of Zanka no Tachi before you reveal the Bankai itself. A small detail, but we see Kang Du trying to use Daiguren Hyorin Maru, and it's actually purple here, confirming, as if we didn't already know, but the Bankai, when in the hands of the Quincy, seem to just take on a purple effect in general. It's not just changing colour to suit its new wielder, but so far all of the Quincy seem to be wielding a purple variation. After this, though, we do then get that final shot from 506, where Yamamoto is holding his smoking, charred blade, and he says the name of his Bankai, after which we then move into the very start of 507, where Hashwolf observes this change and actually mocks Yamamoto's Bankai. The next moment is also pretty similar, as Yamamoto lifts his blade to his face, and he says to Royd, oh, you know, you think you know my Bankai, but... Do you really? Could it have changed in the last thousand years? Why don't you feel for yourself if my Bankai is still the same or not? And again, just every instance of them actually clashing, of them actually fighting in this episode is fantastic to behold. It's so wonderful to see. Yamamoto again just flings himself at his enemy. Again, those speed lines, those tracks of fire left in his wake as he swings his blade at Royd. Royd narrowly dodges, but the sword slices through his cloak. And Royd is wondering, you know, where are the flames? Yamamoto's Bankai is all about fire. That is the power of his of his Bankai. It's all condensed into his sword to make one slash of hellfire itself. So what's going on here? Darting forward, Yamamoto brings his blade down from overhead and strikes the floor. And in the instant that he does, in that very moment, a chasm opens up in the ground, shooting through the Soul Society, ripping the floor apart in a massive earthquake and effectively obliterating everything from the point the sword has touched. I'll be honest with you, I think this is a difficult power 
to get across in the original chapter, and the anime just does it so much better. I think it just comes across so much clearer in the anime what's actually going on here. Yamamoto is simply obliterating the existence of everything within the range that the tip of his blade touches. And seeing it disappearing in a flash like that in the anime is so much more impactful, I think. For the most part, though, that is all the same as it appears in the original chapter, except afterwards we are treated to yet another extended sequence. This moment in the source material is actually pretty simple. Once Royd correctly deduces where those flames are situated on the tip of Yamamoto's blade, Yamamoto just simply tries to swing at him one more time, but Royd manages to dodge. Here, though, we get another action-packed sequence where both fighters end up in the sky. Royd is attempting to flee from Yamamoto, grabbing some of the rubble that's been thrown up into the air and tossing it towards his enemy, but Yamamoto swats it aside before decimating the last piece in a massive blast of fire, destroying the rubble around him and approaching Royd once again. As Yamamoto attempts to strike Royd another time, Royd manages to successfully kick him away and the two of them land on a nearby rooftop. Much in the same way as he does in the original chapter, Yamamoto reveals and explains the power of Zanka no Tachi East as he lifts his blade up, and suddenly the red-hot, searing line of heat appears on the edge of his blade. As Yamamoto explains the ability of Zanka no Tachi East, Kyoku Jitsujin, his line about how the Blute defense that the Quincy have will offer Royd no saving grace here is actually completely cut, and instead they just continue with their fight. Royd gets in close to Yamamoto exactly the same as he does in the original chapter, simply saying with a smirk on his face that Yamamoto's power means nothing so long as he is never touched by the blade, and with that he attempts to strike Yamamoto across the chest, only to realise that his sword has basically completely disintegrated. As the two of them now land on the floor with Royd attempting to work out exactly what's going on, we get another brand new sequence. We're shown a brief glimpse once again of the battle a thousand years ago as Yamamoto talks about how all of the Quincy are already dead, having died all that time ago. Now we know that this depiction of the fight a thousand years ago can't be 100% accurate, and obviously some of that is to preserve one of the biggest twists in the entire series. We know, of course, that Yu Harbak a thousand years ago didn't look like the way he does as we are seeing him here. He looked like Zangetsu. And also we know that not only does Yu Harbak not die here a thousand years ago, but a large number of the Quincy actually managed to successfully escape into the shadows. But what we're seeing here is really awesome anyway. A defeated Yu Harbak drenched in blood, basically lying on this mound of Quincy corpses. Yamamoto's sword then erupts with a powerful rippling flame as he activates Zanka no Tachi West Zanjitsu Gokui. And this again is basically presented in the exact same way as it is in the original chapter, with that wonderful side-on view of Yamamoto as he is just engulfed, swallowed up in his own garb of flame, looking absolutely awesome as well. As Yamamoto tells a now pretty scared looking Royd that he should consider his power, the flames that he is wearing, the flames of his sword, to be an embodiment of the sun itself. That signals the end of chapter 507. And now the flames have rushed back onto the battlefield, and once again we are thrown, essentially, into the jaws of hell. There's an awesome extra detail that really helps, I think, with the immersion. It helps you to feel like you're actually there when you see things like Yamamoto actually melting the ground beneath him, sinking into this oozing, bubbling magma. That is exactly what it would be like if, if a power like this could even be logically represented. That is exactly what it would be like. The episode then continues with chapter 508, the opening of this chapter, which begins with Hashwolf observing Yamamoto's new divine power, wondering how heat like that could even appear as physical flames before realising that this must be Yamamoto's overflowing spiritual pressure. And this moment is pretty much shot for shot exactly the same as it appears in the manga. As Yamamoto steps towards Royd, he says that if they don't end their battle soon, all of Soul Society, including the two of them, will be swallowed up and reduced to ash. And there's no denying that the anime kind of goes overboard with this moment really ramping everything up to 11, especially when you look at it side by side with the original chapter that honestly looks subdued 
in comparison. Here in the anime, this tempest of fire is just creating an arena of flame, massive walls of fire are surrounding and threatening to swallow up Royd at any moment, and he looks tiny when in comparison to the might of Yamamoto's Bankai. But before we can continue, we get another new scene of Uryu, which again is really awesome to see. Uryu continues to delve deeper into the history of his own clan, learning of the Licht Reich, the Quincy Empire that was controlled by Yuhabak a thousand years ago, supposedly with the goal of annihilating all hollows. I love this detail. Seeing small things like the Licht Reich brought up, really makes me very happy. The Lichtreich, the idea of this empire on Earth that Yuhabak had, isn't mentioned in the original story until the Friend Saga. That's about 50 chapters from the end of Bleach itself. So to see them already laying the groundwork for Yuhabak having this empire on Earth is really fantastic. And we would actually get more hints towards this a little bit further into the episode. We then get more of those ancient Quincy drawings, more of Yamamoto depicted as this hellish monster as his Quincy victims suffer and die in his wake. And then we get an image image drawn of the extinction event 200 years ago, which is really cool because it depicts the Shinigami as if they are coming down, descending from heaven itself to purge the Quincy. But I think the next section is really interesting, and this is when we go back to what I was saying earlier regarding the scenes with Uryu in this episode, and I think they're trying to do something with this character here. Uryu kind of comes to the conclusion that it's a foregone decision that Shinigami and Quincy can never get along, despite what his grandfather wanted, despite what his grandfather died believing. And then we treated to some flashbacks showing Ichigo and Uryu as friends. You know, these are a Shinigami and a Quincy getting along. Except the flashbacks they have chosen are very specific and obviously done with intent. While the flashbacks show on a surface level maybe Uryu is wrong, these two have shown that you can get along, they are also all presenting scenes where there is some kind of loophole involved regarding Ichigo's involvement with the Soul Society. Whether they are moments like Ichigo's legitimacy as a Shinigami being called into question simply because he is just a substitute Shinigami, or moments where the Soul Society actively abandoned him, leading him to have to go to Waiko Mundo to save Orihime himself, these are all moments where Ichigo is quote-unquote not really a Shinigami. And we also, of course, see that moment from earlier on in this arc where Uryu says he can't go and help his friends because as a Quincy it's not in his nature to save Hollows. All of this combined with depicting Uryu as sitting alone under a bridge paints a picture I think of someone who is growing increasingly isolated and questioning his place in the world when his own clan have returned and declared war. My opinion about this scene is that it's part of an effort designed to make the audience more sympathetic with Uryu's plight and more understanding when he eventually joins up with the Vandenreich. We then continue with chapter 508, where Royd feels himself being scorched simply by being in Yamamoto's presence. This is all really fantastic and basically handled in exactly the same way as it is in the original chapter. We see Blue Vane working overtime to keep his body from turning to ash in Yamamoto's very vicinity. Yamamoto mocks Royd for having no options left, which is a really great moment, again the same as it appears in the original chapter, when Royd decides to summon a colossal arrow to launch at Yamamoto. Again, this looks fantastic. Fantastic. I love seeing him draw it. I love that close up on his face before he flings the arrow towards the head captain. Yamamoto looking enraged as he slices it in half, a massive blue explosion detonating in the sky behind him. Even this is slightly different to how it appears in the original chapter, where it's just not quite as dynamic. In the original chapter, Royd launches the arrow at Yamamoto, but Yamamoto just kind of bats it aside and it explodes next to him. But, I mean, for all intents and purposes, it's the same thing, but the anime makes it look so amazing here. We then get another shot taking us back a thousand years, possibly my favourite one so far, where Yamamoto reminisces that, yes, once Yuhabak's sword is no longer usable, he will instead resort to using his arrows. But what I love about this shot is what I didn't expect at all, and that's that we get to see Sasakibe was there as well, also standing atop a mound of Quincy, 
Chelsea, pinning Yuha Buck in on one side while Yamamoto faces him on the other. It's so cool seeing Yuha Buck bloodied and beaten Sasakibe on one side, his captain on the other as they pin him in. It's really good and it makes everything involving Chojiro feel that little bit more personal. We're treated to some more incredible animation when a monstrous Yamamoto seemingly rises up from the lava, magma just dripping off of his feet, as we get this crazed close-up of his face as he seems to be just contorted with rage and a lust to kill as he basically says to Roy, right, let's do this, and he charges towards his foe, preparing to finish him off. However, Royd isn't totally out of options yet, as he flings his hand forwards, and these reams of ancient Quincy scripture burst forth from his fingertips, as he activates Kershen lead, Zankt Sphinger, one of the strongest Quincy spells ever known. The ultimate Quincy spell that combines both offense and defense, and if you step foot inside of it, you will be struck down by the light of God. Yeah, that's pretty badass, and yes, as always, it looks fantastic here in the anime. Royd's line, however, about if you think that a Quincy is only limited to their bow and their cross for combat techniques, I'm afraid you're quite mistaken, is actually cut here. Now here we get a moment that I imagine everyone was anticipating. I know I was certainly looking forward to seeing how they were going to portray this as Yamamoto activates Zanka no Tachi South, Kakaju Manakushi Dai Sojin. As he plunges his blade into the ground and seemingly heats up the crust of the earth itself, sending flames cascading through the cracks in the floor, a sickly darkness emerges as the skeletons, as the undead, charred corpses of Ryujin Jaka's victims rise up to obey their new master. The skeletons are presented here in 3D animation, which does look a little jarring when next to the 2D animation of the rest of the episode, but actually for the most part I think they are handled pretty well. I think the core thing the team had to get across here was how creepy and how unnerving this ability actually is, how unholy this ability actually is, especially in the face of Royd's spell which supposedly calls down the light of the Lord himself. This is the total opposite, rising up from the depths of the underworld. For the most part, though, it's all handled pretty much the same as it is in the original chapter. We get a couple of those same sweeping shots as the skeletons rise up around Yamamoto as they close in around Royd and his zanked Schwinger collapses around him. The ground cracks, heaves and breaks as the land turns into a hellscape around them. And I have to commend the anime here. I think it just does a phenomenal phenomenally good job of just making this ability look completely terrifying to behold. Not only are the skeletons creepy, I love, love, love the use of a deafening silence, a silence that just engulfs the battlefield. There's no music, just that aura of evil as Yamamoto's ability encroaches on the landscape, as the skeletons climb and crawl, twisted and broken, out of hell itself to seek down Yamamoto's foe. The rest of the sequence involving South is fairly similar to how it appears in the source material, with a couple of crucial differences. Upon seeing the skeletons, Royd mockingly chastises Yamamoto for his ability to be able to raise the dead, saying that he is a disgrace to the name Shinigami before he leaps at Yama, only to be blocked by a massive wall of skeletons. As Royd thinks that these skeletons won't be enough to hold him back, he suddenly begins to realise that he recognises some of them in one of the cruelest, most deliciously nasty twists of any ability I have ever seen in this series. It's so cool that not only is Yamamoto raising the dead, but these are actually people that he himself has killed in the past. And Royd looks on in just abject disgust and terror, disbelief, as he sees the faces of people he used to know in front of him. Zedritz behind him, grabbing onto his shoulder, Argola and Huber, all characters that we would later see in the Friend saga down the line. 
Up next in the original chapter, Yamamoto turns and walks away from Royd, putting some distance between them. This moment is pushed in the anime to a little bit later on. But the line about Yamamoto saying that he is putting some distance between the two of them is cut completely. When Yamamoto triumphantly talks to Royd about why they haven't stolen his Bankai, saying that they can't because they don't know the fullest extent of its abilities, again, it's basically the same as it appears in the original chapter, except here, Yamamoto's mention of Ichigo is cut completely. Royd then screams at the top of his lungs as he bursts out of some of the skeletons, but this next sequence is handled slightly differently, and again, I have to give props to the anime. I think it's handled better here in the episode. Basically, in the original chapter, it's pretty straightforward. Now, I appreciate Kubo didn't have a lot of time, a lot of space to work with, so as far as I'm concerned, he did the best he could. But in the original chapter, as Royd screams at Yamamoto, he just sort of begins to run through the skeletons, busting through them, smashing them out of the way. It's a lot more drawn out here in the anime, funnily enough, but it's a lot more protracted and given a lot more time to fester. It's a lot more sinister and it feels a lot more personal. In the anime, Royd can only step, stagger, slowly towards Yamamoto in a gruelingly painful fashion, flicking between the past and the present once again. In the present day, he is being dragged back by the skeletons and he can only just about pull them off of his body as he moves towards the head captain, hatred on his face. In the past, however, it's perhaps even better. As Yuhabak himself trudges towards Yamamoto in the past, the skeletons are of course replaced by his dead men, the men that followed him into conquest and died as a result. They're reaching out to him on the floor. Many of them are just corpses. There's a wonderful moment where Royd is looking at the skeletons in front of him, and when it flashes back to Yuhabak, they are replaced with the faces of the men who followed him into battle. We see Hubert wearing his friend Saga Acura outfit. Really awesome to see again those details being brought forwards from way further into the story to here. But that is just such a good moment, and it cannot be understated, I think, how dark this moment is. You know, with a forward-thinking determination, Royd pushes onwards. There's an amazing shot of him crushing a skull underfoot as it rises up to meet him. It's so well adapted, it's incredibly well handled, and I think it adds an extra layer of emotion to an already raw scene. I just, the more I think about this scene, the crazier I think it gets. I just love the idea of him wading through his men, seeing their faces again. This is definitely a moment where the anime is really able to come out on top. Yamamoto screams at Royd about all of the Shinigami that have been killed. At this point, emotions have risen to bursting point on both sides of the battle. I love, again, seeing it flitting furiously now between the past and the present as that same hatred has existed between the two of them for the last a thousand years. And I love that as Yamamoto talks about all the Shinigami that have been killed, the last one you see, of course, is Sasakibe, the most real, the most recent, the most raw and effective I think the last straw that really broke the camel's back that pushed Yamamoto over the edge into this spiral of madness. In this enduring conflict of a thousand years, Yamamoto has been able to live this false life, this false pretense that everything's fine, that his mistakes won't come back to haunt him, and Sasakibe being killed is not only the first act of revenge, but it's just the last thing to push Yamamoto over the edge. Yamamoto then activates his final technique, Zanka no Tachi North, Tenchi Kaijin, and it might just be one of the most spectacular things I have ever seen from the Bleach anime. You know what's funny? Back in the day, people were a little disappointed with North. I think a lot of us had really built it up in our minds that if Kubo was slowly drip feeding us with these abilities East, then West, then South, and each one was growing in intensity every time, North must be something completely unimaginable. Many of us thought it might be a meteor, which is funny considering what happens later on, and when it turned out to kind of just be a big fiery gets a tent show slash, while it looked pretty cool, it was a little bit underwhelming. The anime rectifies that. <laughs> I think it's fair to say the anime delivers North as the true spectacular finish that it always should have been. As he is engulfed in swirling Tidal waves of flame, Yamamoto swings his blade at Royd, 
and it explodes like a nuclear blast, a brilliant blinding flash of white that vaporizes everything in its path. First, the skeletons are reduced to dust, reduced to ash. Any lingering memories of the Quincy army from a thousand years ago, Yamamoto wants them gone. They are obliterated. And then Royd himself faces this almost sunlight burst of attack as it just completely engulfs him whole. We see him unable to even hold on as his body is just completely rocked from head to toe. Once the light finally dims, we see what has become of Royd. Virtually the entirety of his body has been completely vaporized as he collapses to the floor. This scene is even slightly more gory than it is in the original chapter as well, as here we can actually see Royd's bones where they have been severed. But as Royd collapses to the floor, a sad, quiet Yamamoto disengages his Bankai. It is a somber moment for all involved, although Yamamoto feels he has finally closed the book on the war from a thousand years ago. He has finally taken revenge against Yuha Bark, or so he believes. He is not content. There is a look on his face that makes me feel as though it won't bring him the joy he so desperately seeks. Nothing is bringing Sasakibe back at the end of the day, but at long last he can maybe put this fight behind him. The rust on his blade disappears, that charred nature of his sword fades away as he returns to his base form, Zanka no Tachi disappearing, and as it does, as it lifts off, the heavens open, that moisture is allowed to return to Soul Society, and rain comes crashing down to end the fight. However, as we get to the cliffhanger of chapter 509, all is not as it seems. Lying on the floor to Yamamoto's eyes is a defeated Yuhabak, except he suddenly lifts his hand to the sky, watching as the rain falls and apologizes to none other than Yuhabak. As we begin chapter 510, as I said earlier, the first chapter from volume 58, The Fire, something is already cut. The backstory of the Sternritter twins, Royd and Lloyd, has been removed entirely, which I think might be contributing to a bit of confusion among anime-only viewers, as I've seen some people wondering how the same person that Kenpachi killed could now be back here to fight Yamamoto, but I assure you they are two different people. They are twin brothers. I totally get that confusion. Honestly, it always felt like this flashback was kind of just thrown in here a little bit to explain away the fact that there was another Lloyd twin. And so without it, I can totally see where that confusion is coming from. This whole Royd twist was never well received, myself included. I'd never really liked it. Honestly, even so many years later, I just wish that Yuhabak had defeated Yamamoto of his own accord after a gruelling and bloody battle to the end. There is a really cool moment, however, when he mentions Yuhabak, we see just from his mouth that he has already turned back to Royd. The next sequence, again, is very, very similar to the original source material. Yamamoto spins around demanding to know who he really is. Suddenly, the first division barracks explode in a blast of blue light and and of course, the real Yuhabak appears on the scene. As Yuhabak addresses Royd Lloyd saying that he did his job well, something confused me a little bit, and it's something I've wondered about before in the past too. Yuhabak refers to him as Sturmitter Y, the yourself R of Royd Lloyd, which is actually how I think it was translated in the past as well when this twist was first revealed. That might sound ridiculous, but what I think it means is that Royd Lloyd is actually just a composite of the brothers Royd and Lloyd. It's not, a, it's not a singular name, it's just their two names put together. It implies, of course, that they are one and the same. There's, that's the whole point. They're supposed to be able to mimic people. They look identical as well. So it kind of makes sense to me that the name Royd Lloyd is just their two names put together as opposed to just being a first and a surname. What really adds to the confusion about this is that while Royd is introduced in such a way, his older brother Lloyd is not and never is. He is only ever introduced as Sturmritter Y the Yourself Lloyd Lloyd. If he had been introduced in that moment where he is killed by Zaraki as Sturmritter Y the L of Royd Lloyd, you might then be thinking, well, what does that mean? Who is who is the R? Who is Royd? And that would immediately foreshadow that he has maybe another half or a brother or something like that. 
And I think it would just make sense with the naming conventions that, that Royd is later given. But for some reason, Kubo only gave it to Royd as opposed to Lloyd as well. I don't know how many more times I can say these characters' names before going crazy, but it makes sense somewhere in my mind anyway. Of course, Royd wells up in the exact same way he does in the original chapter before Yuha Buck finishes him off for good, though rather than just having his legs left behind beside the crater, one of them lands next to Yuha Buck in a nice grim detail. Now, when Yamamoto asks Yuha Buck where he has been all this time, he says that he has been down in the central prison beneath the First Division, speaking with Aizen. Of course, this was a majorly exciting moment back in the day, but in the original chapter, we never saw any of this discussion. All we got was a reused panel of Aizen strapped to his chair during his sentencing from chapter 423. In the anime, however, we do get the entirety of their meeting, which is undeniably really exciting, and I was very happy to see it. A part of me can't help but wonder if seeing Aizen here like this does maybe diminish his big return in chapter 617 just a little bit, especially seeing as it's basically the exact same scene, just swap out Yuha Buck for Kyoraku. But I have to say, what they have done here is really fantastic. Firstly, the lighting is glorious. It looks so beautiful with the pops of neon purple and pink and red. It looks absolutely wonderful. Not at all how I imagined it, especially considering I think it's supposed to be pitch black in the original chapter, as Kyoraku even says, those of us who are innocent cannot venture further into the darkness. So the fact that there are lights around Aizen is interesting. I do wonder if it's just done for the fact that we have to see Aizen, so I guess that's maybe why they did it, but it does look absolutely brilliant. And I do love hearing Aizen saying that Yuhabak is inviting him, the Quincy King is inviting him to join the Vandenreich. Yuhabak, of course, says that they both have the same goal, they walk the same path, they want to destroy the Soul Society, and I love this for, for two reasons. Firstly, because it gives us already a defined, clear motive for Yuha Bark, something that was really missing a lot of the time in the original version of the story, and secondly, because it shows on a slightly deeper level that Yuha Bark just doesn't really understand Aizen at all. But Aizen mentions that he can't stand to see the Quincy King following in a Shinigami's footsteps, basically trying to achieve the same goal that Aizen did, and unamused, Yuha Bark turns to leave, realising that this is a lost cause, as Aizen has refused him. But I like that Aizen tries to drag out the conversation a little bit. Again, this idea of him messing around a bit with Yuha Bark's perception of time, based on what we know from presumably next week's episode, but also the very final battle. Aizen is placing Yuha Bark under Kyoka Suigetsu's spell at this point, which is how the Almighty doesn't work on him in that very last fight. It's also a nice little detail that Yuha Bark knows about the Hogyoku, knows about its powers, but still phrases what he says in a way that implies he could actually kill Aizen if he had the time. One tiny detail here that I do think is a bit strange is that in this scene, the seals on Aizen's face have been lifted in exactly the same way that they are when he talks to Kyoraku. Now, this could be a reference to Spirits Are Forever With You, because as a Shiro supposedly lifts some of Aizen's seals at some point around this time, which would explain maybe why some of his face is showing when Yuha Bart goes to visit him. However, when it comes to chapter 617, Return of the God, which is when Aizen is first properly reintroduced into the canon story, we see a colour page spread where his face is entirely sealed up. But because we get this extended scene with Aizen, understandably Yuha Buck talking to Yamamoto about his discussion with Aizen is cut from the anime. As Yamamoto prepares to challenge the real Yuha Bark, he activates his Bankai once again, but Yuha Bark steals it this time. A great scene. They are kind of speeding up that activation ritual sometimes, but I think it works really well. I love seeing the flames being dragged into the medallion, turning into black shadows as they are drained 
into this thing. It's a really cool visual. This is much the same as the original chapter, but I do love the moment where Yu Habak calls him spitefully Genryusai Yamamoto as a clear reference to Chojiro after mentioning maybe I should resurrect some of your deceased subordinates. Again, it's that bitter hatred these two characters have for each other, which I love so much, especially since up until now, Royd was only calling him Yamamoto Shigakuni. There's a lovely little shot where it seems like you see Yamamoto's fingers wrapped around the hilt of his blade. It looks as though they loosen momentarily, like he's about to drop his sword as his resolve falters, but then he grips it again as he's ready to fight. Yamamoto rushes down Yuhabak, but in the rain, Yuhabak uses his blade to summon this enormous Quincy bow, which fires down a huge arrow, which in actuality turns out to be Yuhabak's massive Reishi broadsword. Again, fantastic visuals, fantastic imagery. I love how the rain is just pounding the earth, pelting down from above in this absolute fury that really gets across that the Soul Society is about to experience its utmost despair. Yamamoto should still have access to his Shikai, so I do wonder in this moment what would happen if he did something like Enetsu Jigoku to just completely swamp the Soul Society in flames, whether there was any chance for him to get out of it or not, I don't know. But I love that as we get Yamamoto's tired and defeated face, his resigned face, that close-up of his eye, his sword slowly, where he once gripped it with a tight resolve ready to keep fighting, it slowly just drops and clinks on the ground below. He is letting it hang by his side, basically, as he resigns himself to defeat and presumably to his ultimate fate. That resolve that he was able to muster up in that moment to rush Yuhabak has finally shattered completely. Yu Habak, with that same wicked shadowed grin that he has in the original chapter, says farewell, Shigakuni Yamamoto, as he raises his blade into the air. We suddenly get a close-up shot of Yamamoto's face taken directly from 511, as Yu Habak brings his blade down. Honestly, while I like it, I'm not sure how necessary that shot from 511 was. Presumably, they're hopefully going to still use it next week because it's one of the most impactful shots in that sequence of events that happens there. It's kind of weird they showed it here because it's supposed to happen after he gets cut, but regardless, this moment is still really very powerful. And of course, the episode ends on a pure white screen, a jettison of crimson blood fills the air as we see Yamamoto has been sliced and looks like he has been cut pretty much entirely in half. And so they end episode 6, The Fire, on the cliffhanger of chapter 510, exactly where I thought they should. After the credits, we are of course treated to the preview poem for next week's episode, episode 7, Born in the Dark. And the preview poem showcases Biakia during another of my absolute favourite moments of the series that again, I'm really hoping they get right. During that moment where he is basically saying, I'm leaving this all to you. Ichigo Kurosaki, just a great, great moment. The poem reads, A petal falling, never to bloom again, a petal in flames, full of beauty. Considering, however, that this is a preview poem for next week, I do actually have to wonder if this is referring to the conversation between Byakuya and Ichigo. Byakuya, near death, drenched in his own blood, smashed into that wall, is the petal never to bloom again. While Ichigo standing before him, the chapter title of 512 is the stand ablaze, is that petal in flames and full of beauty as he stands ready to defend the Soul Society. And so that is it for episode 6, The Fire. This was a long one, um, but like I said, this is one of the most important episodes of this first season, if not the most important one. So hopefully I've done it justice. Personally, I think the anime did. I think it did manage to deliver on this huge titanic fight. It looked absolutely amazing and there were numerous points during this video where I think the anime improved on the original source material, which is not easy to do, not an easy feat to achieve, and so I'm really very pleased with what we got. I think the voice actors all put in an amazing job, particularly, of course, Yamamoto's voice actor this week just rose to the challenge and really encompassed 
all of that rage that Yamamoto was feeling inside. I think it looked absolutely wonderful. The lighting was amazing. The fluidity of the movement was just absolutely great to behold. The new scenes they include added so much, I felt. And we even got to see Aizen, which, while I think it is fan servicey, I absolutely loved it nonetheless. And of course, it's also time to add yet another Sternritter to our Sternritter in Memoriam board. Only one this week compared to the bloodbath that was last week, and this week we are saying goodbye to Royd Lloyd, or as we went over many times in the video, the R of Royd Lloyd, another half of Sturmitter Y, the yourself. And actually, I think that's going to be the last Sturmitter death for quite some time. Let's end this video as we always do with some predictions for episode 7, Born in the Dark. If they do five chapters again next week, it means that they will end with the ending of chapter 515, Relics, which in my opinion is what they should do. I think they should absolutely end it with that chapter because it's a wonderful way to cap off the first invasion. If you don't remember, the ending of 515 shows Kyuraku bringing the warring captains together as the sun begins to rise once again over the Soul Society. Obviously, it's very metaphorical for this idea that they will rise again, that hopefully the darkest part is behind them. It's always darkest before the dawn. That's exactly what the end of this chapter is referring to, what it's showing. The Gote 13 will come together to defend the world from the Vandenreich, despite the massive losses they have suffered. They might want to do six chapters just to stretch to have the arrival of the Zero Division be the cliffhanger for next week, but I really don't think it has to be, and I think it would be way more impactful, more profound, if we bring the first invasion to a close with the resounding imagery of the sun rising over Soul Society. Personally, I just think that would be so much better, watching the rain dissipate and paving the way for for new things to come. Once again, I mean, as always, I am really looking forward to the next episode. This is probably the last one for me in a row of about three in a row where there has been something that they absolutely have to get right. And so for me, this time, it's that wonderful, heartfelt conversation between Byakuya and Ichigo. They just have to do it right. It's one of my favourite moments in the entire series. I've always said that personally, I think this scene will work best if it is totally silent, and that's what I'd love to see. Just the two of them talking, just Byakia speaking to Ichigo, barely able to speak, very raspy, tears coming down his face. I would love that, but we'll have to see how they decide to portray it. Like I said last week, by ending this episode with 510, it frees you up to open episode 7 with that flashback featuring young Kyoraku and Yamamoto showcasing that portrait of the fire demon version of Yamamoto. All of that would be really great. I actually just want to bring up very briefly that fire demon portrait, which seems to show Yamamoto using Zanka no Tachi West, which would imply he did actually use it a thousand years ago against Yuhabak, and we see that in the flashbacks in this episode. But to me, that doesn't seem to line up with this idea that Yuhabak thought he knew everything about Zanka no Tachi at the start of the battle, claiming it was just a sword with massively powerful flaming strikes. Royd didn't seem to know that West was a thing when he struck Yamamoto during that fight, and he is utilising Yuhabark's memories. That's what his power can do. Again, a distinction that you don't ever know about because they seemingly have cut the Royd and Lloyd backstory. I do have to wonder, though, perhaps even more exciting, will we get a glimpse of the original captains of the Gote 13, outside of just seeing them silhouetted. I would absolutely love that, and I think before the end of this week, I'm going to try and do a video talking about that original Gote in case we see them to see if we can get any of them right. As for some things they could cut, as I mentioned before, maybe Shaz Domino could be cut. It really depends on how they want to approach the additional content from the supplementary material. I'd like them to not cut it because it's a really cool moment for Ichigo that he doesn't listen to any of this guy's nonsense. He just strikes him down the moment he arrives in Soul Society. It's very uncharacteristic for Ichigo. And I think that helps to hammer home the severity of the situation. But I could see them maybe messing around with that moment. Another moment I could see them playing around with is when Yuhabak is dragged back 
into the Shattenbereich because supposedly he has run out of time. The reason I could see them messing around with this moment is because this plot point never comes up again. It seemed like Yuhabart could maybe only exist within this shadow world for reasons unknown and could only step outside of it for a certain amount of time but we never learn any more about that. Maybe they will include it and just give us a bit more of an explanation, perhaps? But either way, that's something I could see them toying with. But it will be really interesting, I think, moving on from this point. The end of the first invasion kind of signals the end of really any action in the series for a little while. Now, of course, there is the highly anticipated fight between Zoraki and Unohana, but based on the pacing so far, I think that will maybe only take up the better part of half of an episode. Outside of that, we're in for a lot of talking, a lot of dialogue-heavy moments moving forwards, a lot of characters interacting, and I'm really actually very excited for that. And finally, as for episode 8, personally, I predict they will call it the Squad Zero. Seems to make sense to me, pretty simplistic, but they probably are the biggest highlight of the episode to come. But that's it for the video, guys. I apologise, this has been a very long, very exhaustive, but hopefully comprehensive look at episode 6, The Fire. If you can't tell, I absolutely adored it. I thought it was totally amazing from start to finish. Very few, if any, complaints today whatsoever. I really did love this episode. I thought it was a pinnacle of Bleach battles, of the Bleach anime in general, historically. I think this is probably one of the best looking fights we have ever seen in the series. And it makes me really excited for some of the battles to come. But that's it for the video, guys. Let me know in the comments below what was your favourite moment from episode 6, The Fire. Did you enjoy it as much as I did? Do you have any criticisms for the episode at all? I'd love to know. Let me know down below. Below. Make sure to hit subscribe if you haven't done already and until next time I'll catch you later. I'll see you then.